Hello everyone, uh, my name is Elizabeth and today I'd like to talk to you about uh, Microsoft Azure Sentinel, Log Analytics and Custo Query Language. Uh, before we move on, any views and opinions expressed in this presentation are purely my own and are based on my experience. And I know that there's a lot of people who put that in their presentation, but it's a reason why uh, it's in this one and you'll find out in a second. Um, so let's let's move on to the boring part, which is the part about me. Um, I am a security analyst working at Quorum Cyber. Um, I'm also in my third year of graduate apprentice um, cybersecurity at Edinburgh Linker University. Um, the graduate apprenticeship program is a really cool thing. Um, it allows me to study and both work at the same time. Um, and the experience that I gain in my workplace counts towards my diploma, which is really cool. Um, if you'd like to find a little bit more about how I joined Quorum, there's a little blog post on our website uh, from April 2020 when I joined the company. Um, and it was a really weird experience joining the company during the pandemic. Um, I still haven't met majority of, of people from my workplace in person, which is weird because I worked there for like almost two years. Um, there's also a separate talk that I did in October uh, 2020 about my transition from being an administrator to uh, becoming a security analyst. Uh, so if you just put my name um, in YouTube, the talk will come up. Um, if you have any questions or if you'd like to follow me, um, you can find me on Twitter. Um, and if you have any questions about the presentation or anything that I do, feel free to ask me. Um, I can go off topic, but there is a structure. There is order to this chaos. Um, what we'll do is we'll look at uh, what's a security analyst, what does the job involve. Um, we'll look at the glossary of some common terms uh, that are very often used. Um, we'll look at what is Microsoft Sentinel and also look at Log Analytics and KQL and how the three are connected together. And then we'll talk about career paths in cyber and why working in a SOC um, is a good starting point for career. And if there's time, There'll be a Q&A section. Uh, can't promise that we'll make it um, in time, but I'll do my best. Um, so for this presentation, I did a little bit of research. I was trying to find a um, common denominator for who is a security analyst and what does the job involve. Um, at Quorum, um, my responsibilities are quite flexible. I'm able to work with other teams, which is really amazing because that's how you learn and that's how you gain new skills. I was thinking that maybe I'll be able to find something that will give you a definition of what a security analyst and what you could expect from this role. Um, so I visited one of the most common uh, job sites like Indeed, Glassdoor, Read, Total Jobs, only to find that all of the job descriptions are totally different and there's different expectations for analysts in different uh, companies. Um, so the job can be as simple as just triaging tickets and forwarding over to the relevant team. Um, and it, also, it can also be as complicated as um, configuring firewalls, uh, providing incident response, uh, doing vulnerability scans and uh, offering security recommendations. And uh, another interesting thing is that there's also no consistency in job titles because you can have cloud security administrator, you can have cyber security administrators, information security administrators. Then there's also seniors and juniors and then you have different tiers as well. So it's all very mucked up and, and there's a lot of things to consider. Um, one of the things that um, I always find a little bit intimidating whenever I start, start a new job is the amount of jargon that's being used day to day. Uh, so usually for the first week when you're attending um, team meetings, you have absolutely no idea of what people are talking about. So in order to make this uh, talk a little bit easier for you guys, um, I've prepared a little glossary and I'll go over the terms um, so you can get a better idea of uh, some of the things that are uh, very commonly used as abbreviations when talking about cybersecurity. Um, so first thing is managed security service provider. So Quorum Cyber is a managed uh, security service provider. We offer different services to companies, uh, so companies can outsource them if they don't have the team or if they need to uh, provide some additional data or additional uh, help to their internal in-house teams. Uh, then we have Security Operations Center, which is also referred to as Blue Team, uh, which is the defensive side of cybersecurity. And as an analyst, I am part of the SOC. Uh, there's also incident response. So whenever uh, activity has been uh, classified as malicious, it goes over to incident response. And incident response really tries to establish uh, 
the amount of damage, so whether there was any data breached, um, whether there was any lateral movement, any servers that were impacted, and incident response, and this is the part that I absolutely love, also tries to do a detective part of uh, investigating how the attacker got in, how the breach happened. Um, and that's something that I really love doing. Uh, then there's also security information and event management. And uh, this is a tool that provides real-time uh, analysis of uh, security events uh, generated by applications or devices. And there's also SOAR, so um, Security Orchestration Automation and Response. And this is a new creation. Um, the security information and event management tools have been then there for quite a while. Uh, but the Security Orchestration Automation and Response is a new feature which uh, collects the inputs monitored by the SOF, so, so for example the CM, um, real-time data, and allows to define incident analysis and response procedures. And it also allows to pull information from external threat uh, intelligence feeds to enrich the data. Uh, then we have uh, endpoint detection and uh, response. And um, what it does is it provides real-time monitoring and collection of data from endpoint devices. Uh, then we have UEBA, which stands for User and Entity Behavior Analytics. It basically looks at what is a typical behavior for a user. And whenever there's an anomaly, you know that there might be some malicious activity. Obviously, people are the most unstable uh, factor in any equation, so there's no such thing as a standard user behavior, uh, but obviously you can try to establish some pattern of user behavior. So for example, the geolocation from which the user is logging in, device that they're using, um, servers that they're accessing, or applications that they're using. Then we have IDS, which stands for Intrusion Detection System, and um, IDS monitors network traffic uh, for signals that might indicate that an attacker is exfiltrating or stealing data from uh, the network. So it sits within your internal network. IPS, on the other hand, uh, sits on the edge of your network, and it works similar to a firewall uh, between the internet and between your uh, local network, and it denies traffic based on the uh, security profile. So, for example, if there's a domain that has a really low reputation that has been seen um, reported um, in malicious activity, IPS can block traffic coming to or from um, that particular entity. Um, and then we also have SLAs uh, that very often comes up in different job adverts. Uh, that stands for service level agreement. Um, and it's an agreement to how quickly uh, you as an analyst or the company needs to respond to a particular activity. Obviously, it's very important to um, classify uh, the priority of different things, how they need to be investigated. So SLA really allows you to prioritize your workload and decide what needs to be looked at in the first place. And last but not least, and you probably heard me using this abbreviation, it's KQL, uh, which is Custo Query Language, and we'll look in uh, depth at what it is and how you can use it in a second. But as the name already gives it away, it is a query language. So what is Microsoft Sentinel? Um, this is a description from uh, Microsoft uh, Docs. It is a scalable cloud-native security information and event management and security orchestration, automation, and response solution. So there's two of the glossary bits that we covered just before. And what really um, Sentinel does is it allows you to collect data from different sources. So collect logs from either your on-premises environment, your cloud environment. It doesn't have to be Microsoft Cloud. It can be Google. It can be AWS. And store it in one central place so you can investigate it and you can detect based on the logs that you have at hand. Uh, so there's the detection part, and you also um, are able to investigate, and there's also an element of response, so you could automate response whenever a malicious activity has been identified. So let's look a little bit closer at um, Azure Sentinel, how you can get there. So if you browse to portal azure.com, um, and in the search bar on the browser or mobile version, type Sentinel, you'll get to the, the Sentinel platform and the main page. So first of all, what you need to do in Sentinel is start collecting data in order to detect, alert, and investigate. And uh, you can start collecting data by using out-of-the-box solutions already provided by Microsoft in the data connector section. So uh, in the picture here, you can see that there's uh, Amazon Web Services uh, connector already available to uh, collect the data from uh, AWS. There's also connectors for firewall, for I IIS, SQL logs, 
everything is there uh, that will help you to collect the data effectively without doing too much of uh, engineering work. Then once we have the data there, um, Sentinel also has analytics, which has some rule templates to detect anomalous behavior. But it's not just anomalous behavior that you're looking at. Very often, whenever it comes to malware, you're looking at patterns of behavior. So you can both alert on patterns that might indicate malicious activity, or you can look for anomalities or abnormalities that would indicate that there's some unusual behavior um, happening uh, in your environment. Um, for the rule templates available from Microsoft, there's predefined priority levels. So uh, there's highs, which are marked with the red um, line just uh, next to the severity. There's mediums, lows, and informational. And um, if you can see on the panel on your left-hand side, there is a section uh, which contains a rule query. This is written in KQL, and it basically um, establishes what is it that you're looking for in the log? So it establishes the pattern of behavior that you're looking for. And once there is a match for your query, uh, um, alert is generated, an incident is generated, and you can view the incidents in the incident section. Um, incidents next to the incident ID have the priority level, so you can organize your workload and obviously investigate the high priority ones in the first case and then leave the lower ones or the informational ones uh, to investigate last. And in order to view the full details of the alert, so in order to view the events, in order to view the entities, so what uh, is involved in this alert, IPs, users, uh, devices, you can click on view full details. And another interesting thing that is also available is a, a investigation section, which provides you with this cool graph that shows you uh, the pattern of behavior and the, the uh, direction of the attack. So you can see any lateral movement, um, you can see the user, you can see the devices, and you can see whether there was any connection made in between. And another cool thing that Microsoft also provides is entity mapping. So uh, whenever you enable this feature, um, users, IPs, devices um, are mapped into one. And if you access the entity, so if you click on the user, if you click on the IP, it provides you with this page, which provides you a timeline of all the activity related to your entity. So for example, if you're looking at a user and you have an alert for unfamiliar sign-in where user signs in from a device that isn't typical for them, and then you see an alert for a mailbox forwarding rule being created, that can be the indication that the user account has been compromised and an attacker is setting up an email forwarding rule to, for example, abuse the user's uh, email account to send phishing messages. And the email forwarding rule really is there in order for the attacker not to be detected. And uh, another cool thing is the automation that's available with Sentinel. So, for example, whenever an alert is generated, you can post the message in Teams. You can send an email to the relevant team so they can look at it. Um, and also, if a condition is met, you can block the user or block the IP um, or just close uh, the alert in a relevant portal, which is absolutely cool. Now, let's take a moment to pray to the demo gods because I've decided to do an absolutely crazy thing and show you KQL in action. Um, let's just hope everything goes according to plan and there will be no network issues or anything like that. Um, so, log analytics. Um, Think about log analytics as a huge SQL database that contains data from the different log sources. Um, whenever um, you uh, investigate the alert in Sentinel, there is an option to actually go into log analytics in order to get more data uh, to investigate the activity. Obviously, if you only get an IP and only a user, you're not really able to establish what is it that happened there. You need more information from the logs to get a bigger picture. Um, so, log analytics um, uh, stores all of the data from different connectors in tables. And uh, if you think about tables, you have the columns and you have different cells. Uh, keep that in mind whenever we'll be talking about KQL. And uh, KQL is the language that is used to retrieve the data from those tables. Uh, so, we as analysts can investigate the activity. We can get the correct data and get the bigger picture of what's going on. Um, KQL very similar to SQL, very similar to MySQL. So if you guys had uh, those languages at uni, you probably wouldn't have any issue with learning KQL. I would even say that it's easier than SQL from my own experience. 
Um, the difference between KQL and uh, SQL is that with SQL, you can obviously alter the tables, change the values within the tables. With KQL, you can't change the values within the tables. You can append stuff to the tables, but you can't really change the data, the logs that are in there, which makes sense because you don't want to mess with the logs. You want them to be intact. Um, and KQL is used for various things. So I showed you guys uh, in the... Um, log analytics section where you created the rules for the alerts. Uh, the rule for the alert was written in KQL. Um, you can also use it to perform security investigations, so go directly into the log analytics section and retrieve data. You can use it for troubleshooting. So I've mentioned to you guys that it also ingests SQL, IIS, or any other application logs. So if you're an engineering, if you're a dev, and there's an issue with your application, instead of going onto device and looking at the logs like that, you can just go to log analytics um, specify the conditions, so specify what application you're looking for, what server, what time frame, and you can get the logs like that. Uh, it's as simple. And it can also be used for threat hunting. So, for example, uh, Log4j, Internet went on fire, and we used KQL to basically detect any activity relating to Log4j vulnerability, which is cool. So, the demo part. Um, let's assume a situation that we receive an alert where an IP that has been listed in the threat intelligence list has been seen doing something in our environment. And we need to go into KQL, look at the activity, what was the IP doing, um, why was the IP listed in the threat intelligence list, and determine whether it's malicious or whether it's not malicious. And now the reason why we can't just assume that this is malicious is because very often, whenever IPs, well, first of all, there's a limited number of IP v4 addresses. And obviously, one IP can be used, uh, if it's a web server, by multiple websites, for example. So the fact that an IP has been previously seen doing something malicious doesn't really mean that it's doing something malicious right now. We need to go into the logs, get a bigger picture, and understand if it's really doing something bad. Uh, so we'll also look at some uh, free tools that you guys can use as well. Um, so we'll look at Threat Crowd, Talos Intelligence, and Abuse IP Database because it's relevant to what we'll be doing just now. And let's see if it'll work. Uh, let me just find my cursor. So first of all, if we like to um, look at the tables that are within, this is a Microsoft demo uh, site. You guys can access it. It contains live data. So if you'd like to play about with KQL, uh, you can go to the Microsoft demo page and just have a look at the data and try to write some queries. Um, so this query, uh, this query here, um, search, which means it's, we're looking for something. Uh, the asterisk is a wild card, so we're looking for any value, and uh, we're summarizing the output by the name of the table. And if we run this over the last 24 hours, please work. There we go. There's uh, 57 tables that are available in this demo site. And uh, from the names of the tables, some of them are self-explanatory. So if it says sign-in logs, it means that it contains information about the sign-in activity. Um, there's uh, some cube node inventory, uh, app service, HTTP logs. Um, you can have a mess about if, if you're interested in learning a little bit more about KQL. Uh, now, I have selected an IP, which uh, probably was seen 48 hours ago, because I've been doing this presentation yesterday, and I found a really interesting IP. And um, if we uh, use the same query as we did before, we just really want to replace the wildcard, so any... Um, any data by the particular string that interests us. So we're looking at the IP address in question. And we can see that there's uh, four tables in which the IP is present. There's VM connection, Azure Network Analytics, Azure Network Analytics, and Azure Diagnostics. Uh, actually, this one contains a little bit more information. Azure Analytics IP details. There we go. So we want to look at the VM connection table and see what this IP has been doing. And um, the thing about the data in, um, in log analytics is that there's so many different data sources. There's 57 um, tables just in this demo site. It would be impossible for me to know the name of, of each and every column in each table. 
So a really useful command is limit, which just gives you a number of rows from the table, random rows, so you can get an idea of what data is stored within the table. And uh, if we run this command, it will return us 10 random rows, and we can sort of see what information is stored within the table. So we have time generated, we have a computer, we have the direction of the connection, the process name, source IP, destination, port, protocol, so basic connection information. And now we want to look at the specific uh, IP address. So we want to define the condition where remote IP has, and then we want to add the string that contains the IP address that we're looking for. And the project bit is a clever way to actually show the columns that will be interesting for our investigation. Uh, so to sort the data in a way that as an analyst, I'll know what's going on in here. So if we run this command, it will give us the details of three connections that have been made from this remote IP address, the direction of the connection, so the connections were inbound, so into our network, the computer to which the connections have been made, the destination port, protocol, the bytes sent, and bytes received. So from this information, I know that the destination port means it was HTTP protocol, so there's probably a web server that's on that computer, and uh, from the naming convention of the computer, I assume that it might be to do something with retail? I'm not sure. Um, so let's uh, dig a little bit deeper. So let's have a look at those tools that I defined previously and try to get a little bit more information about this IP address. Um, a cool tool is ThreadCrowd, um, where you can look up uh, URLs, domains, and IP addresses. And um, in ThreadCrowd, there's an option to vote whether something is malicious or not. It's a free tool, um, open source, and um, there's a, just a button here where you can specify whether you think it's malicious or whether you don't think it's malicious. Um, from most of the votes received for this particular IP, it does have a malicious status, but there's no details telling us here why is it malicious or what was it reported doing. There's uh, no uh, web pages, no domains attached to this IP, or at least that, uh, that appears from the information provided here. So let's move on to the next tool and let's look at um, the IP in Talos. So Talos is a Cisco tool. And again, you can look up IP addresses, you can look up domains. It's really cool and it provides you relatively reliable information. So in here we can see that the location of the IP is UK. Uh, we can see the host name, the domain name, and the network owner. Um, we can see that there, it has a very poor email reputation and that there is an unusual spike of the volume of traffic that has been seen from this particular IP. Uh, it also mentions that the IP has been seen um, listed on a block list. And uh, it also shows us the IP range and other hosts that are connected uh, or seen as part of this particular IP range. Cool, so now let's look at the information in Abuse IP database. So in here, the geolocation of the IP is actually Netherlands. Um, it shows us that it looks like a data center web hosting. Um, it shows us the ISP, so the company with which the IP is registered. And if we look a little bit further down, it actually has information on the um, reports where the IP was reported as seen doing something malicious. And in the category, we can see what was it seen doing. So majority of uh, the entries here is port scanning. And you can see that this data shows that the IP is actively being reported as seen doing something malicious. So if you put this information together, you might assume that that IP is doing some sort of scanning activity, uh, sending requests to retail VM uh, over port 80. So the question that needs to be asked is whether this computer should be internet facing and whether this port should be open. And that's something that you would raise with the customer or with the company. Cool, that's the demo. Let's go back to our presentation. Let me just find my cursor. There you go. So we've investigated the activity. We used KQL to retrieve data and get information about what activity the IP has been doing. And then we used um, uh, the free tools to actually look at um, what was it involved uh, with, why was it reported in threat intelligence, why is it considered to be malicious. Now, the reason why you can't just assume that if something was marked as malicious, it has to be malicious. Um, as I mentioned before, 
very often an IP might be used by different things. So if it's a web server, it could host 10 or 20 uh, different websites. And if you just block an IP, it means that you're blocking all of those websites, everything that's hosted on this particular IP. And a fun situation that I've been involved in uh, was whenever I received an uh, alert for an IP that was associated with C2 activity. So uh, C2 activity, command and control, is whenever there's a piece of malware um, on your device that's trying to reach to its mothership, to, so to the C2 domain, to um, get more malicious content downloaded onto your uh, device. And um, I've logged into Defender to look at the detail of the activity in more detail. Defender is an absolutely amazing tool, but we won't cover it today. There's just not enough time. Um, and in Defender, I only saw this one domain being browsed three times. So I saw a user logging in. I saw a Chrome session being started. And then I saw the domain being browsed three times. And that was it. So normally with C2, you would expect there to be more random domains being browsed. The malware would try to reach out all the time. If it wouldn't be able to connect, it would try something else. I wasn't able to see anything there. So my question was, what was that domain doing? Like, what is it? And it turned out to be a bagel shop in New York. So I thought, okay, let's look at the IP address. And I looked at the IP address in ThreadCrowd, and it turned out that there's a bunch of different um, domains, a bunch of different websites that were hosted on this particular IP address. So my next question was like, okay, so let's look at the user that was performing this activity. And sure enough, the user was actually based in New York. So it was someone who was just trying to buy a bagel, browse to a website, but because the website resolved this IP that was marked as malicious, he wasn't able to get to it because it was blocked. Um, so in the end, he probably didn't get that bagel. Um, but yeah, that's why you don't want to mark IPs as malicious or blocked IPs. There, um, there's more to it. So why would you want to work in the SOC? Um, it's an amazing learning experience. Um, you're ex uh, you're exposed to those all different alerts that are relating to various activities, and it's all a learning curve for you. Uh, whenever you're investigating an alert and you're not sure what it's doing, you have to learn and you have to. Um, identify what's the activity, why the alert triggered. Um, for me, again, this is my personal experience uh, working in the SOC means that I'm also working with other teams. Um, there's incident response, there's engineering, there's pen testing. So all of those teams, we have to cooperate together. We're like one organism that has to work as a team. Um, team working and customer facing, so it helps you to build up on those skills. Um, not all um, Security analyst roles are customer facing, but if you work in a role like that, that's a very valuable um, experience. It's also networking. So if you cooperate with other teams, you get to chat with them. You can ask them about, you know, what does their role involve? How does their day look? Um, ask them to teach you some cool stuff. Um, it's a good career opportunity. So um, you build up your skills, you build up your knowledge, and you can move on to other teams. Um, and it's also a prospect of good salary. So from the research that I did, um, very skilled security analysts can earn really good money. Um, so, yeah. Now, the important things that um, I know that majority of you are students or very, in very early stages of your career. So, very important things that I'd like all of you to remember is that the best way to learn about the industry, from my own experience, is to actually work in cybersecurity. Um, you're able to chat with different people, get an idea of what the job involves. Uh, very often, the idea that we have in our heads or the idea that the job descriptions give us are very far off from what the job actually is. Uh, career paths can be changed. I was once an administrator. I was an optical assistant. I work in different jobs. And uh, if you haven't noticed, I'm really old. Um, probably majority of you are closer in age to my daughter, who's going to high school next year than to me. I'm that old. Uh, so you can change careers at any point. I changed my three years ago uh, drastically. And uh, professional burnout is real. Uh, so try to find a job that will make you happy. Try to find something that you're passionate about. If, if you'll be working in a job that, um, you know, is stressful, is making you very anxious, you will burn out quickly. Um, imposter syndrome, it affects many cybersecurity professionals, no matter how experienced they are. Um, I still feel that I'm learning and there's so much more that I need to learn. And I don't think I'll ever get to the stage where I'll be like, I've seen everything and I know everything. 
um, technology is developing, there's no new threats, new vulnerabilities, you will never ever get to a point where you'll be like, I know everything. Um, if you're looking for your first job, make your CV stand out, show how passionate you are. So if you're participating in conferences like this, show it. If you're taking part in any um, capture the flags activities or doing try hacking or anything like that, show it, show how passionate you are. Um, networking through conferences, amazing. You've got the sponsor stands there. Go, ask questions, show yourself, ask if you can send a CV, ask what are the job opportunities there. And don't be afraid to reach out to companies directly. Um, I've actually got the job by approaching Quorum at a um, similar conference back at Napier. And I just went straight to the managing director and asked if they had jobs. And that's how it all started. So, what's the time? Okay, there's still time. So, do you have any questions, guys? Yes? Do you find something with automated responses? Like, you know, you were short, yeah. you were short, and that there's issues sometimes with automated responses not being investigated as much. Yeah. You know, like say something says, oh, this is automatically resolved, and you could potentially miss follow-up activity or whatever. Like, how do you deal with that? Well, um, whenever you're automating things, you really need to be careful at, as what you're automating and what you're whitelisting. It's very easy to miss malicious activity. So... Um, in Quorum, we usually have the process of uh, discussing it in a wider team and uh, people throwing all the bad stuff, saying, well, if you do it that way, this is the bad thing that could happen or this is the bad thing that you can ha uh, that can happen. So always leave it to open discussion. Don't just assume that you know everything and that your decision will be the best. Put it out for the wider discussion before implementing. Cool. Oh, any other questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, do you use that just for the analysis part, like after Well, you would in use KQL whenever you're setting up the alert rules, because the alert rules are written in KQL. There's some pre-configured ones in Sentinel, the template rules that you can use. But obviously, there's so many threats, new vulnerabilities that are coming out that you might want to write some custom ones. Um, so as a security engineer, you'd use KQL to write those queries to detect activity. As an analyst, I would use it to investigate the alerts. So I would receive an alert, for example, for an IP, and I would have to go into the logs to see what activity this IP has been involved in. Um, and there's another aspect of, uh, for example, incident response uses KQL. So it's an easy way for them to get in, try to establish how did uh, a malicious actor get in or how the malware got onto a device and then try to establish the vector of the attack. So whether there was any lateral movement or you know whether other users were compromised. Um, and threat hunts, you can use KQL for threat hunts. Um, I've mentioned Microsoft Defender. It's an amazing platform and it uses KQL as well. And the uh, amount of logs and the level of detail in those logs is just mind blowing. Um, but that's for a separate talk. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes? Um, the challenges of post visiting post visits. Yes, so. Um, I know when you use the brain scene, you have so many of these things. How do you zero in? That's one. Two. Uh, I don't know how many. Um, I don't know if I get to promote Sentinel, or you also have experience with other uh, SIM solutions. So, and wouldn't know um, what your opinion is with respect to SIM solutions and how they help limit these challenges of post positive post positive. Yeah. Uh, so with regards to other tools, um, I'm three years in cybersecurity and I two years in working as a security analyst. And Quorum is the only company I've worked so far and we're a Microsoft based company. So obviously I wasn't exposed to other tools. I can give you a comparison of which tool is better or which tool is worse. There's uh, divided opinions. And the thing that you'll notice whenever you're looking at um, security analyst position is that every company will use a different tool. 
And uh, there's like Splunk, for example. There are uh, different platforms that are used as well. Um, I think that if you have a proper mindset, the learning curve of, of using a new tool isn't that difficult. But it's the mindset of investigating things, of identifying whether it's malicious or if it's benign, uh, understanding of how networking works, of how traffic uh, moves and asking proper questions. Those are the skills that you need as an analyst. The tools are just an extra part that you use to um, move your investigation forward. But it's the mindset that you need in order to investigate it properly and get the proper um, proper resolution, proper um proper conclusion uh, for what you are looking for. With regards to false positive and false negative, um, they are extremely uh, difficult, especially false positives. Whenever you think you're looking at a malicious behavior, you have to be really certain before closing off an alert as benign that what you're just identifying as benign is actually that. So very often in my uh, in my job role, whenever I'm not sure, I would reach out to other people. I wouldn't limit it to just my opinion of, I think it's benign. I would get a wider audience to look at something and uh, come to the same conclusion or challenge, uh, challenge me to say, no, actually, you need to also consider this, this, or this. Does that answer, does that answer your question or... <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah? How well, in your opinion, does Sensor deal with aggregating data from different sources into common fields? You know, like you could be investing one if someone goes to firewall logs. Yeah. Does it have like a common schema to aggregate that, or is it something I know a lot of other things like Splunk and Elastic you struggle with, you know, kind of having a common schema to search for different sources? Is that something that Sensor would point out? It, no, it, it works much better. You've got everything sorted within tables and there are out-of-box solutions to, for example, uh, ingest firewall logs or to ingest AWS logs. Um, another question is of understanding what those logs mean. So obviously, AWS environment is, for example, completely different to a Microsoft environment. And as an analyst, it's sometimes challenging for me to understand those two different environments. Uh, same for the on-prem activity, the on-prem logs are all ingested into security event table within Sentinel, and that contains all the activity. So it contains user behavior, it contains application behavior, and seeding through that noise can be very challenging for me as an analyst. Um, but again, it's a matter of a learning curve. Um, if there's an unknown that you're looking at, you will ask other people, you re will reach out to other people and try to learn as much as you can to then be better the next time you look at the same issue. So, any other questions? Yeah. Uh, how fast do you say the full version of human resource analysts or senior analysts? There's a lot of other versions out there. Uh, senior analysts just on general individuals. Uh, how long is that for everybody? So I, I guess that would depend on the company. As I've mentioned, there's different job titles to security analysts. So there's like cloud security, information security. Some companies have different tiers of a security analyst. Some companies have junior and senior position. Um, within Quorum, there would be a, a junior position, a senior position, and then a manager position. But there's also option to move laterally, so to other teams. For example, if incident response is something that you're interested in, you would obviously, from a security analyst, try to move to incident response, where you would mainly try to investigate the malicious behavior and uh, try to investigate the vector of the attack. Um, if engineering is something that you're interested in, there would be an option to move from a security analyst to engineer or to pen testing. Um, so you can go up, but you can also go sideways. So if working in the SOC isn't fulfilling your expectations, there's always option to branch out to other departments, other teams. Nice. Any other questions? Yes. Um, thank you very much for the presentation of uh, Sentinel. Um, just thinking about it when you walk with one, you found something suspicious, mm -hmm. and you have to start to get things when you get something false. Does it have any integrations where you have to uh, look at historical data or even actual capture capture type of form in events, historically, or so it triggers to say, if you see this again, I want to capture. Yeah, 
Um, so um, I think by default, uh, the data is stored for three months, but obviously there are options for companies to store the data for longer. Um, the issue is that the more data you store in log analytics, the more money it costs. Same for enabling connectors. So uh, you can ingest your firewall logs, but obviously firewall logs can be extremely noisy. Uh, so very often it's a matter of filtering those logs before they get ingested into Sentinel in order to save money. Um, and a thing that I've, I've noticed personally is that very often uh, companies don't realize how precious the logs are until something bad happens. And you tell them where actually there's not enough data to investigate because you haven't had this and this and this enabled um, so yeah, so so very often something that has to happen in order to that metric to be ingested and be available for analysis. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. I hope that you enjoyed. If you have any questions that you don't want to ask in public, feel free to approach me. I'll be around. Um, I'll also be here for the after party. And um, you can also find me on Twitter or find me on LinkedIn and you can message me like that. Thank you very much.